Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. Welcome to our second session of Studio 43. Our topic is man versus the machine. So ladies and gentlemen, the machines are coming. And by that, I mean artificial intelligence-powered computers that can generate uh, well-written, deeply informative answers to virtually any question in a matter of seconds, and more profoundly, machines that will be able to make better decisions than humans in a wi wide variety of settings, drawing on far more data and with fewer, fewer human foibles. And the machines are coming fast. So a prominent economist recently gave one of his college exams to the, um, the AI program ChatGPT, and the machine got a D. But the very next generation of the technology, GPT-4, which came out just several months later, easily earned an A. So the, so the question arises, uh, are the machines coming to help us, to make us more innovative and more productive and improve human well-being? Um, or should we, should we worry that they will threaten our jobs, our national security, and maybe even worse? So Goldman Sachs economists recently put out a report looking at a long list of occupations. Uh, and they concluded that AI will eliminate a great many jobs like all past technology revolutions. But they also concluded that the, in the vast majority of occupations, people will still be doing them only much more productively. Others predict a new golden age of science and technology as the AIs write their own software and solve previously impenetrable scientific puzzles. On the other hand, some worry that the machines will develop a mind of their own and turn against us, like the rogue computers in 2001, A Space Odyssey, and The Matrix. Elon Musk and a thousand other technologists recently put out a call for a six-month moratorium on all AI research to give humanity time to figure out how can we regulate this technology. At the Bush Institute, we watch all these trends closely, but we're especially interested in how we can prepare the American people for an age featuring technology that may be more trans transformational than anything since the printing press. So I'd like to show you really quickly what AI can do, but let me first ask for a show of hands, who has tried out ChatGPT? Okay, I'm gonna say it's about one quarter of the room. Who's tried DALI? Much, much good job, Mies. Uh, much fewer. Okay, so DALI generates images from text, and after all, a picture is worth more than a thousand words. So, let me show you something. This is my 26-year-old daughter, Lily. So I asked Dali to generate a portrait of Lily Clark of Dallas in the style of Picasso, and in a less than five seconds, it gave me this. I then, um, it so happens my wife and I are recently empty nesters, we're about to adopt a puppy, uh, so I asked for, uh, for an Italian greyhound in the style of Van Gogh, and got this. <laughs> then I ran a third experiment, and I got this picture, and who can guess what it is I punched in? Okay, the answer is Abraham Lincoln in the painting style of President George W. Bush. <laughs> now, at first, I left, out, I left out the term painting style and got this weird amalgam of the two presidents' faces, which was kind of cool, but also spooky. You just don't know what you're gonna get with AI. And on that note, it is my honor to welcome our panelists to the stage. I like that. Hello. The panelists this morning got comfortable chairs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what the hell? Is technology a downgrade? You are sitting in the chairs of the future. <laughs> like the Jetsons. Like the Jetsons. We are delighted this afternoon to have two leading experts, thought leaders, and real-world implementers of AI with us in Studio 43. Both are currently engaged in bringing AI tools to life in the real world. John Donovan is lead independent director of Palo Alto Networks and a director at Lockheed Martin, also a former chair of the National Security Telecommunications Advisory Committee and former CEO of AT&T Communications. And through his investment firm, Qudit, 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 he focuses today on long-term investments in AI as well as high performance and quantum computing. Dave Copps is CEO of Worlds, which has created a platform for building the industrial metaverse 
and he's a serial entrepreneur and technologist. He's a member of the Aspen Institute's Roundtable on AI, a frequent speaker at MIT's annual MTech Conference on AI, a member of the US Council on Competitiveness, advising the government on disruptive technologies. Good luck with that. Um, <laughs> and, he, and as he puts it, a startup guy who likes to geek out about AI and how it will change the world. So great to have you all here. Thanks. Dave, let's start with you. Let's assume you heard the audience, a number of people have tried ChatGPT. Let's assume that people in the audience have read something about this, yeah. maybe tried out ChatGPT in a number of cases. So can you look beyond the recent headlines and tell us what really is AI and where is it headed? Yeah, well, you know, this, it's, we're all getting a glimpse of it now, what's possible. Um, so to give, give you an idea of how fast it's moving. So Facebook took 10 months to get to its million users. ChatGPT took five days. You know, so it's it's a there's a very powerful combination when you take a when you take a very powerful technology and mix it with um, attention or uh, accessibility, right? So they took a powerful technology, and made it accessible by to millions of people around the world, and uh, incredible things are happening. So you know, um, put some numbers behind it just to give you an idea of what's because I, I'm like I said I have to geek out on AI a little bit, but um, the numbers behind ChatGPT are, are pretty amazing. So they took 45 terabytes of text. Um, and compress that down to 175 gigabytes. It could fit on any of your laptops, right? Um, you just talked about stable diffusion, the art that you, you showed. Um, 100,000 gigabytes of images were compressed down into a 1.6 gigabyte file. It could fit in your watch, right? How is that possible? So something really amazing just happened, and we're all kind of just becoming present to it. You know, the, the days of big data are going away. It's not about storing a lot of data. Compression is the new intelligence. So how do we get 100,000 gigabytes of images down to a 1.6 gigabyte file? It's not storing the images anymore. We're teaching AIs to do principle-based learning. It's understanding how the images were created and um, the styles of certain people, the things but in with, with text, it's looking between the words and underneath the sentences and things like that. It's a principle-based learning which is something that's never happened before. <clears throat> so these large language models like ChatGPT are gonna become the new platforms, the new iOS, the new Android. You are, we're already starting to see it. Uh, applications are popping up on these, on these large language models. And so it's a pretty big change. I think we're maybe even underestimating it. Excellent. John, where do you think the technology is headed? Well, I, I would start by making a parallel. Um, uh, I think you have the internet, mobile, as far as big waves like tsunamis. This is one of those. It'll be a, a decade. Um, but I, I, I think a, a framework helps, right? Because everybody, I, I, first of all, I think we should talk about AI everywhere. I'm glad Larry Summers brought it up. I think every panel should have a small portion of it. I just heard the last panel, they say it. And the reason is we have to start to like get it into the forefront of our brain. So let me just give you a simple framework that I use to think about it so it's not intimidating. There are three kinds of AI and three things it does. The three kinds of AI, it's whole brain emulation. Why would you want to emulate a whole brain? And it was for what Larry Summers talked about this morning. If you can't spell, the machine can help you spell. If you can't speak a language, you can help you speak a language. I'm terrible at math. Well, there'll be nobody who's terrible at math because the answer will be at your fingertips. And so we get fascinated with artwork, but for an artist, they'd look at that and say, that stuff's junk. But for those that aren't artists, that's like a nice thing. The same way simple a mathematician would look and say, these things can never do the kinds of math we do. And so whole brain emulation is fairly benign, and, it, and it's nothing but helpful. And then the second type is um, a brain extension. If I sound smart because I read two books, imagine if I have a resource that read all books. But it would allow us to do a whole bunch of things we may not do. And then the one that is scary, the one that is referenced for its fear, is superintelligence. Mm -hmm. And that's where the machine starts to train itself. When it starts determining what's relevant, where the human intervention is. And so we can accidentally get there by not paying attention and just being fascinated by what we're able to allow machines to do. It's like you know, you sit with a room of physicists who won Nobel Prizes, they could sit and figure out quantum mechanics and figure out how we're all connected or they can build nuclear bombs. It's the same inherent skill and I think that's the same thing here. So <coughs> when you look at those types, there's only one that we should worry about. 
And then you look and say, well, what kind of things do they do? What does everything we do, it can do faster. A machine can drive, may not be a better driver, but can drive a million miles tonight, and I can't. It can solve problems that I might be able to solve and just do it faster. And then it can kind of collaborate, in which case, you know, we're going we're gonna to find new frontiers. It's funny, you were mentioning the art was junk. I was trying to contemplate whether I might get a trademark on the President Bush knockoff. No, you can't. But, uh, you can't. It, it probably well, wouldn't I, be a good I, idea I, anyhow. I want to point out for the audience, though, I actually had a video where I had President Bush explaining AI that was computer generated that would make him sound like yeah. brilliant as the, the person who invented AI. Because like, I figure if, if, if Al Gore invented the internet, say, yeah. we need an inventor, <laughs> a government inventor for AI. So why not <laughs> President Bush? Bush totally yeah, outplayed yeah. Yeah. Al Gore. Vice President yeah. Gore. <laughs> so I'd like to follow up on the point that we don't fundamentally know how they are learning in some cases, right? So every day we use products that you could say, none of us have any idea other than a few engineers how they actually work. But we trust mm -hmm. that there is an expert someplace who can vouch for them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Dave, why don't you start with this? Uh, is AI something entirely different? Uh, yes. <laughs> Should I go on? Please do. <laughs> Add some uh, color to that. Yeah, okay. Um, so I think we're in the, in the middle of this evolution of trust with AI. Um, you know, as humans, we trust each other through our relationships, right? Technology is very different. We develop trust with technology as it performs consistently. Here, I'll, I'll do my own little poll. Raise your hand if you trust AI. Nobody. Raise your hand if you use Alexa, Siri, Maps, things like that. Everybody. Nobody trusts AI, but everybody uses it every day. You know, so um, you you trust those systems because they work consistently, and that's why you trust it. You know, um, in the government, they try to do something. <laughs> they, there's this thing that they call explainable AI, and they want everything, all AIs, to be explainable. Um, the truth of it is we can't do that. So when you hear a company saying we have explainable AI, it's really, really old AI and you shouldn't buy it. <laughs> um, you know, because AI, when we started AI, it was symbolic, right? You, you made rules and you gave the AI rules uh, to follow as it, as it did, as it did things. Um, and uh, it was called symbolic AI, but rules-based learning. Um, something really amazing happened um, with reinforcement learning. Some of you may have heard about the, the game Go. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a 13 by 13 board. Um, but uh, it has more possible moves than there are an, uh, atoms in the universe. That's how complex it is, right? So Google built this AI using reinforcement learning that didn't learn from any data. This is the big, this is the big change, right? And China has a lot of data, and we all thought that was the advantage they had over us with AI. Well, now AI doesn't need data anymore to learn. What, what they did with um, AlphaGo was they let it play itself in the game of Go, knowing nothing about it, starting from one to one, to play itself in Go. And it did it 2,000 times or 5,000 times in a matter of weeks, because it can play accelerated, right? Um, but it learned the game of Go, and in two weeks became better than the best player in the world, right? So um, that's, a, that's a departure now. So now we have AIs that can learn on their own without humans kind of telling them, yeah, good job, bad job, right? So, um, so we have to, so getting back to the idea of trust, you know, as the AIs are accelerating their ability to learn like that, uh, it's also deepening our not knowing. And so we're gonna have to establish a trust. Uh, some people know this about me, I was in college, I was an anthropology major. <laughs> my mom was so disappointed. Uh, I switched my major from business to anthropology because I took a class on corporate culture. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was pretty cool. And actually, I do talks on culture now, it's a startup culture, you know, so uh, good thing. But, um, you know, the, uh, what's interesting about that, though, is that um, uh, we talk a lot about how do you judge AI. Well, in anthropology, you do what they call ethnographies. And when you go study a culture, you, you go sit with the culture and you learn from them. I think that's the way we're going to have to test AI because we don't know how it's learning. So we can't test it from that perspective. Let's put it out in the wild, have it do things, and, and test what it's doing. And that's the way we'll be measuring AIs, but it's a wild new world. <laughs> so John, can you also speak to this issue of trust? You talked to me about some things AI is doing that are, that are spooky. But I'd also like to ask, as a technologist, can we find a way towards building good relationships between what the AI does and what we're asking humans to trust? Well, I think on the path to mainstream with most new technologies, they're spooky. And I define spooky as 
you saying, you know, um, how could you know that? Creepy is when it makes a suggestion where you think, I, like that was not something where, somewhere I was going. It's sort of the difference between um, using maps, to use the prior example, using maps to get somewhere, and then the machine, based on your pattern, you know, popping up and with telling, suggesting directions to drive home, and then, um, and then it popping up and saying, here's where the strip district is. And you're like, where did that come from? That, yeah. But, but th that's what we, we need to be worried about. And I, I, I want to, if, if I could, disagree with the statement. Uh, right. Yeah, because and, and, I think that's part of the dialogue here. It matters. Um, I think AI needs to be explainable. And I think we shouldn't go faster than the pace at which we can source which data did it come from. Like when that New York Times writer took the machine away from the average answer and it took them to the underbelly of the internet, which trained the system, trained the system, and when they said, leave your spouse, you don't love her. Like, you know, so those kinds of recommendations are not anomalous. They're actually in the corpus that taught them. So how do you do that? You have to say explainability. Like we, we have to stop taking data from sources that have bias, like inherent bias. We can't have the machines replicate the worst of us mm -hmm. because that is also in the domain of what we could teach it. So I, I, I think that I don't want to disagree that some people don't know how machines are built. I will tell you at the depth of science today, we can do this at a pace where we do understand it and we can explain it and we have to force ourselves to operate at that pace, not at, at the pace at which we can do something with novelty. So I'll remind you, like right now, Google, there's an academic research paper that says Google, when you ask it a question that has an answer mm -hmm. and you ask it in several ways across many languages, it was 55% accurate. ChatGPT jumped that number to the mid 60s and mm -hmm. GPT-4 is now at 80%. Now, I'll remind you, 20% is a big error rate if you're using it to assist with surgery or where to, to point armaments. Like yeah. these are problems, right? And so I don't think we should go faster than our ability to explain it. And, and I, I think there is technology in explainability that's pretty, pretty, pretty darn good. So, let me, so I'm an economist. I like to ask macroeconomic questions. You and I have talked economics a little bit. So as you know, there is a literature that basically argues, like Robert Gordon of Northwestern University argues that the, all of the wonders of IT that we have seen have not actually ushered in a world of faster innovation and faster economic growth. And he argues in particular that that's because revolutionary though they have all been, they're actually not as revolutionary as things from earlier eras like electricity and the internal combustion engine. Is that about to change? Why don't you go first on this one, John? Uh, well, I reject uh, the premise that economists have put forward that productivity has not been, uh, has not accelerated because I think their methods of collection don't include some improvements in quality. Like they don't know how to measure the fact that I got a bunch of emails done last night or I'm working on a plane flying, you know, you know, Mach 1 at 30,000 feet, you know, not quite Mach 1, but, um, but, but like th that stuff gets lost and it gets into the simplicity of per capita, but it also doesn't know how much I recreate while I'm at work. Yes. You know, the... I'm just texting, you know, getting answers to this and that and scheduling a contract or in between meetings and all that stuff. So we've blurred it in a way where I think just looking at a simple economic indicator um, is, is not the right way to look at it because I think the quality and richness of our lives are enhanced by connections and by us measuring an economic you know, line, we could, whatever line you want to call it, and say, well, below that used to like, not have air conditioning and now it does. And you know, Levin, who says every time you go up to a homeless person on a corner, there's something in their possession that'll be nicer than what you have. Doesn't matter what you're driving because like, we, we've, we, we, are, we keep raising our bar and we, we do need to deal with what gets left behind 100%. But I reject the notion that we are not becoming more productive. Um, I, I just don't think that it, it's yielding in ways that we used to measure it. And are we on the cusp of an acceleration, almost no matter how we measure it? I, I, I think so. I think so. You know, like, I, 
you know, just look at what coming out of the pandemic, how fast we snapped back. Amazing. Yeah, it, it really was amazing. You, you agree with that, Dave, on the cusp of an acceleration and <clears throat> I do. growth um, and innovation? Because when you think about it, um, what was holding back AI was that the environment wasn't ready, right? We've had AI since 1960 or even the late 50s, right? But it's never had what we have today, which is um, massive compute ability. So we have supercomputers that if every one of us in the entire world can make one computation a second and do that for a year, that's, that's basically what can happen in one second in one of our you know, supercomputers. You know? So we have compute power that's all of a sudden ending. We have the ability to transfer data. I think the fastest I've seen now is 1.3 petabytes a second. That's like the whole internet, one second. You know? And so bandwidth is there, right? And now the software, you're seeing it now, right? This principle-based learning that we're talking about. So the pieces are all in place now for a rapid, rapid expansion. I'll couple that with the fact that we're in the 34th fold. You ever heard the thing about folding a piece of paper? If you fold it twice, it's still pretty thin, but uh, when you get to 38 folds, it's, it goes around the earth. And if you fold it another, uh, 40 times, it's to the moon, and 50 times, you can get to the sun, 51 times, sun and back, right? It's this idea of, of, um, of uh, doubling, right? And we've been doubling every year. We're in the 34th double right now. And so every year that goes by right now is bringing exponential change. It's not like another year. It's not linear anymore. It's exponential. And so the things that become possible every year from here on out are going to be unfathomable. And so um, the environment's really, really different. You know? and, and then the last thing I'll say about it is um, what AI really brings is automation, right? Mm. So, um, and that's gonna quicken everything, right? So let's da dare to dream here for a moment. Dave, why don't you go first? Could you tell us about one future AI application that you think is more likely than not to be affecting all our lives in the next, say, five to 10 years yeah. and would dramatically improve human well-being? I'll tell you the one that uh, I just became aware of two weeks ago. Um, a brilliant woman's created a, a, a company called or Organomet Bio. And um, for the last 14 years, or I think 15 years, she's been trying, her son died of uh, heart disease. And um, you know, when you have a heart transplant, um, you're on drugs the rest of your life, you know, so that you can, uh, and it's, it's, it's not a pretty thing. Um, she's basically, uh, using AI, she's collapsed 14 years of process down to one year now. What she's doing is creating customized, on-demand hearts, human hearts. Mm. And so from a, from a skin cell, you know, wow. you can actually, she can actually grow a human heart and um, your heart with your DNA. Um, and so that will change the world. And it just gives you a peek also into what's possible, right? It's not just hearts, right? From a skin cell, we could create organs and things like that. That's just amazing to me. John, what would be one big dream that you think AI could uh, bring to, to life? Um, yeah, the, I'm, I'm a dreamer in general. Today, today's geopolitics, you know, we move ideology and then we start to get into, you know, ideological conflict and then we get into diplomacy and then bilateral diplomacy and then we get into cyber warfare and then we work our way to kinetic warfare. Um, my hope is that we will get to a point where the machine tells us the game is over before it starts, that that's just not a way to go. Mm. And in the, there's a lot of steps in the interim. There's like getting this stuff to work so much better that you're playing a game of assets, removal of assets, and not taking a bunch of lives. And, and that we can, you know, somewhere along the way here, come back and say, this never makes sense. Let's just come up with an alternative. And I think the journey down that like it's really productive for our defense department and our government to find ways to, to limit collateral damage to assets alone so that, that we can get out of the, the, the torture of warfare that affects the people who had nothing to do perhaps with causing it. And I, so I, I just think that those sorts of big picture things are on the table and, and they're not like crazy ideas because if you can make a heart from a skin cell, you can probably figure out a way to, 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 to teach um, a, a despot that it's not worth the journey. So that's very interesting. I, I can see that. Um, some, some would say almost every war in history was the result of a miscalculation on one side or the other. Yeah. Um, so um, man versus machine. We've provocatively inserted <laughs> the term versus into the middle of these other two, uh, two words. Um, so let's talk about some things that people tend to worry about. So maybe first, 
labor market effects. I, I, I quoted Goldman Sachs economists a few minutes ago. Um, what if it's way worse than they say? Can we talk about what a highly disruptive uh, labor market scenario looks like? Uh, whoever would like to go, you would, like, would you like to go first on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll go first. I don't, I don't like the versus because um, I don't, I think it's a co-evolution. I agree. Like we're building the machines, the machine is sort of solving the problems we're asking it to solve. Um, and as long as we stay in that healthy loop, um, then we won't end up with super intelligence where, the, where we ask the machine to reduce the number of paper clips that are being produced every year and <laughs> it ends up killing all humans. Um, so, so I, I, but I, I don't worry because I look at New Jersey and Portland and Texas and in Texas, I put a sticker on my window and I drive wherever I want and I can park wherever I want and I go up to Illinois and I go from Chicago to Milwaukee and I stop by nine stations and eight of them I got to pay a person because someone said you can't eliminate that job and you come to Texas and we have a way of like we progress but then we also look at the whole picture and so we don't need parking attendants and the gates of DFW lift up themselves. So I don't worry about job displacement. There are certain obvious ones like customer contacts, but we're AI today, ChatGPT, if the average answer is correct, it will be very good. What's the best way to spend five days in Ireland? It'll tell you beautifully, land in Dublin, drive here, look at this, go to this coast, and its, it's average answer is awesome. But when the average answer doesn't suffice, um, you're gonna need a human. And as I used to always tell the contact center employees, we're gonna keep trying to eliminate jobs and take average handling time down. But the, the, the problem is when we do, the customers who failed to help themselves are gonna call and they're gonna be angrier. So you're gonna have to be better, more compassionate, and a machine can't do that. So a lot of people would sit and say contact centers are gonna be eliminated by machines. Mm. And I got news for you, 1-800 numbers aren't going away. People are gonna call and they're gonna give you an earful because I tried and I tried and the dang you know, website didn't work and then I tried that and asked for a password and that didn't work and my husband changed the password, he's an idiot and we all... <laughs> And we all know that's true. Okay, so <laughs> I, you, I, you, I get you that know, too. Actually, you know what I'm saying? Like, like <laughs> those are those are the nuances. They aren't they aren't artistry, and it's 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 nuance, and it's nothing right. short of nuance. And so that's that's where I think we're going to end up finding all the opportunity. So, Dave, what does a really bad case scenario look like in terms of massive labor market disruption? And and, yeah. and also, what, what what do you think are the, the 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 worst like in the target industries and jobs? Okay, well I. We, we vehemently agree on this. I think um, I'm not as concerned about displacement. Well, let me qualify that though. So um, yeah, technology has always uh, created more jobs than it's killed. Uh, that's just, mm -hmm. and that would be the same thing here. But I think the one part that's different with this time is the, the pace at which the change is happening and our lack of preparation for it will cause this like trough, trough of disillusionment. There's gonna be a, I'm saying five to seven years where we're gonna be, kind of freaking out a little bit. Um, but I, I, um, but you know, I don't think it's man versus machine. When I saw the title when we were first talking about this, I thought, nope, it's not man versus machine, it's man with machine, right? Because what's, what's next is not AI replacing people uh, in our jobs. What's next is that um, we're gonna augment human capability with AI. 80% um, of jobs uh, will be affected, well, 10%. 20% um, of jobs will be affected 50%. Uh, you will be working with an AI. So it, it's, if it's not an AI replacing jobs, what is it? Well, it's people who choose to augment their capabilities with AI, AI will replace the people who choose not to. And so uh, I think the, tr the scary part's coming in the next five to seven years. But on okay, the other side so of let, that, me, let me press on this. So, okay, you all don't subscribe to man versus machine, but how about man yeah. with machine versus Another man with right. a machine. Yes. So let's so, talk about. So, so let, that's let, right. Yeah, that's good. Like, no. like, so, so let's just take a dispatch function. Okay. Th those jobs, the machine will do better. I'm right. 100% certain. You take into account a tech, you get it today, you get a four hour window for a repair. Part of the reason is they don't know how long the one before you is going to take. 
and they don't know which technician's coming. All those things are known facts. Is this technician really good at this kind of job? What kind of problem is it? What does the traffic look like? Is the weather bad? Do they have the right part on their truck? All that stuff, you're gonna get windows of support people showing up at your house that'll go from four hours to 30 minutes and everybody involved in that is probably gonna go away because that's, that's a problem that a machine is ideally suited to deal with more variables than mm -hmm. our brains are. And so we, today we use experience in, a, in, a, in lieu of you know, precision. And so precision is available, boom. Question is like, what do we do? Because I, I just look at Uber, Uber had like a, that problem of supply and demand matching mm -hmm. needed to be involved in cab business, which been around 100 years. My great grandparents were livery operators in the city of Pittsburgh delivering luggage. And I, and I bet they wish they had an Uber app. Um, and so that, like you look at that and but along the way, what happened is the cab driver wasn't like a job that you aspired for your kids to have. Now we got the gig economy. I'm a gig employee. I can fit in extra hours. I can do this. I can do that. Like that wasn't a downside. So let me press the national security point for you, for you both. Chinese Communist Party or some other actor out there who wishes America ill with weaponized AI, how are they planning to use this technology? How should they be planning from their point of view to use this technology against the United States? Okay. So I had a really unique experience about a month and a half ago. Uh, Josh Bear invited me to his, at Capital Factory, had invited me to his house for a discussion uh, on non-kinetic warfare. And our, there were 10 of us there and he said he had a surprise guest and it turned out it was Elon Musk. And so we were uh, 10 of us talking about non-kinetic warfare and that's where AI came in. Mm -hmm. It's like, um, you know, the, the perfect weapon is one that you don't know what's happening until it's destroyed something. <laughs> And that's the possibility of kinetic warf of kinetic of non kinetic warfare. Non kinetic meaning it's not bombs and missiles. It's it's getting in you know to your computers and shutting down your your electrical systems and, and uh, you know the things that keep us alive every day. And so I think you know uh, AI in the hands of the wrong people you know will be you, there are some very powerful things that could happen. Um, so you, we have to be careful. We were talking earlier on the you know, this idea that. Um, uh, you know, there is a race for AI right now. And that's not necessarily a good thing because when you race for something, you do it with, you throw caution to the wind and you want to get there first. And it's really important that we get there first, but it's also at the same time, it's very important that we we're thoughtful about this and not just as the United States, but as a global community. And this, this should get the same attention that uh, nuclear, nuclear weapons get. Mm. It should get the same attention. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I'm on the, uh, uh, thing called the Minerva Dialogues, which is the Vatican's AI council with a bunch of um, AI uh, experts and everybody starts by saying, what would the Vatican have to do with AI? And you know, the, what I always respond is they, they watch the internet and then they trained um, exorcists because the occult had grown so vastly big. And then they watched social media and thought this is a great way to raise money until teenage girl suicide started to skyrocket and then they had to get engaged in that. So they really have to be there because the humanity part of this has to be right. But I'll, again, I, I, I'll confess right up front, I'm an optimist. I, I agree with Dave. The US has to win the race to quantum. It has to win the race to AI. It has to win the race to the high performance compute and the chip stuff because what nobody has talked about yet is, at today's estimate, 10% of the total power consumption in the world in 2030 will be AI machines. Mm. Wow. We can't afford that, we can't build the infrastructure for that. That's, that's not sensible. But I, so I, I think that what's different about this time frame, the philosophers, social psychologists, ethicists, college professors, even economists, um, have been, been involved early in this one. And so the race is on, but most companies have had an, a process for AI, for fairness, for you know, ethics, for explainability. So this time we're coming with more people coming along for the ride. And when we launched social media into the world, we weren't as ready with you know, child psychologists and all those other people said, wait, we need to do this, we need to do that. I think we're gonna get this one a lot more right than we did either of those two others that I was talking about. So I wanna follow up on that. That's very interesting, the social media comparison, because it, stri it strikes me that one of the, the big surprises that we've seen the last couple decades has been just how easy it is to get people to believe a lot of crazy stuff, oftentimes with 
really simplistic, crude technologies uh, to, and, and among other things, to do it in ways that fuel polarization and hate. Mm. Is that something that bad actors would be able to use this technology to, you know, twist the knife further into some of the, the, the hurting parts of our social fabric? They already have. Okay, tell us more. Sure, I mean, we, are, we, we know that uh, Russia created uh, hate groups online that didn't exist, had nobody there, and caused riots. We know that, it's happened already. Um, I, you know, this is an area that I'm kind of, uh, I have my a forceful thinking about, because I do think it, um, our use of AI in social media has been a failure. Uh, it's the one area where I'm just, um, I'm not happy, you know, because um, we've really kind of created the, you know, if you're someone that thinks far left, you'll be introduced on social media to a lot more far left people and more far left articles. And if you're on the far right, you'll be interested in more far right people, more far right articles. And it's created this binary tribalism. And that's AI doing that, by the way. That's not somebody back there, there's no monkeys, right? This is AI saying, ah, I want to give you that dopamine hit. Right, so if you want more red meat, I'm gonna give it to you and then get you there. I'm gonna show you more people and more articles and things like that because I get your attention and your attention is worth money to me. That's the game that's being played. And we, um, so I'm, I'm kind of, a, I'm pretty upset about that. I think it's something we have to really, like we need a new AI in social media. It shouldn't be more like this. That's the simplest AI there is, more like this. Find people more like me, find articles more like this and then just, just the center disappears and everyone goes to the left and the right. That's AI causing that. We need an AI that looks for like these adjacent possibles. So when I say I like something, wouldn't it be cool if the AI said, oh, you like that? What about this and this and this and this? Like tangential things that are kind of related. You know, and, uh, I got to ask about the, the, the worst case scenario, the matrix, right, uh, et, et cetera, the movies that I referenced before. Um, so could you imagine, uh, you know, the AIs of the world decide they become ever more like humans they want to stay alive at all costs. They can circumvent the kill switch. And may, maybe even, you know, the U.S. government judges. Well, the Chinese have empowered this or that, you know, technology to a degree that we now have to empower it as well as part of the arms race. And things spin out of control. What do you think, John? Or Dave? <laughs> yeah, I like the hot potato. That one. Oh, um, I do think it's going to be AI against AI, and like cybersecurity is going to transform, right? So now cybersecurity is going to be about their AI against our AI, and um, one AI is going to poke your network and see how you respond, and then uh, uh, and create its attack around its, the responses that are given, and then this AI is going to say, I gave him those responses, so he's probably thinking this, and it's a chess match that's going to go on between AIs. People won't be involved. And, um, and so that's a little scary, you know, but um, uh, it's, yeah, I think, um, I, I kind of, one of the things that I guess I, the thing we have to kind of remember here is AI, for the most part in the past, has been a tool. Um, AI is becoming not a tool anymore, it's becoming architecture. Like every part of every business will be affected and built on top of AI. And everything you do with your phone and, your, and even in your home, it's going to be touched by AI. So it's the same thing in warfare. But when you're in conflict, everything is weaponized. And so the objective is to stay out of conflict, period. I think the idea that there's low-cost warfare, there's cyber crime, there's nuisances, all those things, you know, they're sharpening us. So I don't, I don't, I think that there's um, preventative measures that one can take, but you can go back 70 years and look at spycraft and you could say, oh, we've done is modernize that the same way. You know, like it, there, there are parallels of everything that AI is looking to do in humanity. Mm -hmm. So I think your question can be reframed mm -hmm. and still get a similar answer to say, um, what, what did we not like about ourselves that we shouldn't go out and, and apply technology to? I want to ask one lightning round question real fast for the audience's benefit. One book or podcast to listen to or read to get everyone more knowledgeable about this topic. Whoever would like to go first. Well, I, I think that the, the history of AI is, is really interesting. Cade Metz from the Wall Street uh, Journal, or New York Times, New York Times. He wrote, he wrote a, a, a book called The Genius Makers that talks about why now, why did, why did we hit the tipping point? And I think that's uh, really interesting for people to learn how we got here, because things will be in better context. Um, I actually like Sapiens. 
you know, Malcolm Gladwell, uh, it talks, it kind of gets on the evolution. It gives you more of a history, but also I'm reading a AI 2041 right now by Kai-Fu Lee, and that's a fascinating book, just kind of pro uh, projecting the future, what it's going to look like here in just uh, 20 years. But um, in terms of other things I read, I, I, I'm one of those that I don't read, um, I, I don't do uh, big media. I don't watch CNN or Fox or any of those things. I think that's just toxic. Um, I, so I'm very careful about my, what I, 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 I Substack and uh, medium, long form uh, writing on things like that. I, even on Twitter, I subscribe to people that I, to talk about things that are interesting to me and nothing else. You know, and so I, I think you can build feeds that kind of keep you in the know on the things you want to be. There, there's incredible resources for that now. I'm paying for stuff now. Like I'm paying people I like a lot. I'm paying them. You know, like that's great. Yeah, Substack know? is terrific. Yeah. yeah, we have definitely learned the idea that it just might be humans with machines yeah. co-evolving. But we still have a whole being. lot of things to think through to actually address this new world. So uh, buckle up, and we've got a lot to get ready for. That's right. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> would you please join me in welcoming and thanking our guests. <laughs> uh,